Well, thank you. It's a tremendous honor to open this symposium. I have to say, pretty, pretty intimidating uh, job as well, but it's a wonderful opportunity to, to thank my old friend Bengt and, and, and wish him a very happy birthday. Bengt and I have served on, on the editorial board of QRB for a decade or so now. In fact, um, we kind of had a fight over who would be um, editor-in-chief, and I have to say, I won because he got the job. Um, Okay, well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm tremendously uh, impressed that our chairman actually recognised the misprint in my, my Chinese name, which is Li Dao Wei. Um, and I've just come back from Shaman uh, Da Xue, and, and uh, I, I've been there for two months teaching and so on, and um, in the last two weeks I've been bombarded with all these wonderful invitations for this meeting, but everyone said there was a dress code. And, and I was dressed for tropical Shaman with shorts and t-shirt and stuff. So two days ago I had to go out into, into central Beijing in, in Wangfu Jingdaji and buy some clothes so I don't bring the tone down. So I hope I've done okay. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, this morning I'm going to talk about uh, RNA catalysis. And before I uh, begin with any sort of detail on this, let me just say this is, this is actually important in biology. Um, perhaps a lot of people think that it's a kind of niche activity, but actually two of the most important reactions in the cell are catalyzed by RNA. For example, condensation of amino acids to form polypeptides in the, in the ribosome. And ribozymes are actually very widespread. Now, we can classify them in, in, in four groups, broadly speaking. Um, there are the, the nucleolytic ribozymes that do site-specific uh, cleavage and ligation of RNA, and there's at least six, and that number is growing all the time. Uh, there are the self-splicing introns, but that now clearly includes mammalian mRNA splicing, which is another reaction of major importance in all our cells. RNA's P processes tRNA in all domains of life. And, and lastly, the, the, the ribosome, as I've said, is, is a ribozyme. So uh, uh, very different structures, different chemistries involved. Um, but I, 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 the, the first question then is, well, at least to me as an old chemist, is well, how on earth can, can RNA act as an enzyme? Because when you look at the structures of, of proteins versus RNA, Proteins are ideally uh, designed to do catalysis. They've got a neutral uh, uh, backbone and then this array of 20 uh, different amino acids covering a wide chemical space uh, that, 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 that can be applied to all sorts of different functions in aqueous chemistry. By comparison, RNA has got a charged backbone uh, to which is attached four rather similar um, uh, um, heterocyclic bases. Well, if we look at the... Um, uh, chemistries that are carried out by uh, contemporary ribozymes in the cell, um, then the majority are phosphorotransfer transfer reactions, either transesterification reactions or hydrolysis reaction. The exception to that is, is uh, uh, the peptidyl transferase, where the nucleophile is now a nitrogen and it's attacking an sp2 hybridized carbonyl carbon. Well, I want to focus today on this group, the, the first group, the nucleolytic ribozymes. Uh, um, and if we look at the, the six uh, known structures of these, and this just shows the secondary structure, in each case the arrow points to where the, the, the site of the chemistry is occurring, um, you see they really fall into two classes. Uh, uh, the, the, the upper group, the ha hammerhead, hairpin, and VS ribozymes, are all based around three or four way helical junctions. Whereas uh, these three, the hepatitis delta virus, glomus, and, and twister, are based around complex pseudonauts. So clearly, there are two alternative ways to achieve a stable fold in these autonomously folding RNAs. Now, the actual reaction that's carried out is shown here. So, in, in, in left to right direction, this is the cleavage reaction, we have attack of the adjacent 2' prime hydroxyl on, on, on the phosphorus, going via this trigonal bipyramidal um, phosphorine uh, 
transition state or at least high energy intermediate um, uh, and and then uh, breaking this bond to leave um, oh, sorry this bond to leave a, a cyclic two prime three prime phosphate and and uh, in the reverse direction this is this is a ligation reaction and this reaction is accelerated around a million fold by by the ribozyme so that's what we're trying to explain how RNA achieves this million fold uh, rate enhancement now to give you the bottom line uh, what I'm going to tell you is uh, that it seems that the major component in the catalysis is general acid-based catalysis. So a hydroxyl group is a poor nucleophile. If we can remove this proton with a general base, we can increase its nucleophilicity by orders of magnitude. And we have an oxyanion as the leaving group. If we can protonate that with a general acid, uh, that improves the efficiency. And there's a precedent for this in the protein world. Um, in, in RNAs A, uh, this uses two histidine uh, uh, side chains, two imidazole groups, one in its, protonated, uh, in its unprotonated form as a general base, the other in its protonated form as the general acid. So, so there's a precedent for that. And in the case of the nucleolytic ribozymes, then primarily but not exclusively, uh, the equivalent of those imidazole groups are, are the nuclear bases, such as, as guanine or adenine as we shall see. Now, um, to, to begin with, I want to talk about one member of this nucleolytic uh, ribozyme group, uh, the Varkid satellite, um, which is from Neurospora. Um, uh, so, if we look at the sequence and secondary structure of this ribozyme, this was deduced in, in Rick Collins' lab many years ago, that, that's shown here. So the cleavage and ligation reaction occurs at this position here. And you can see lots of helical sections organized by uh, two principal three-way junctions and a third one, although that one is dispensable. Uh, now, um, uh, there's also, I should say, a, a tertiary interaction between these two loops. Uh, okay, now, a great deal of, of uh, mechanistic and biochemical study in, in principally in my lab, uh, identified two key players in this reaction. Uh, so within this helix 6 here, A756, if we change that to anything else, we lose something like a thousand fold in, in, in the rate enhancement. And then within this loop, within helix 1, where, where this is the cis phosphate, so that's where the cleavage occurs, on the opposite strand, G638, if you mutate that to anything else, you lose 10,000-fold in activity. So these two um, uh, uh, nuclear bases are clearly important, and from various substitution experiments and so on, we, we, we increasingly believed that it was likely that they were involved in general acid-based ca catalysis. Now, if that is the case, if we have a general base removing this proton, general acid protonating the leaving group, of course, the base must be in its unprotonated form, the acid must be in its protonated form, and these are a function of pH. So we can use pH as a way of, of studying this. In fact, uh, we would expect that the, the observed rate of catalysis would be the intrinsic rate multiplied by the fraction of the acid that is protonated and the fraction of base, Fb, that is unprotonated. And we can calculate these fractions from the pKs, if we know the pKs of these groups. And they're plotted here. So this, of course, the acid loses its proton, uh, and so Fa becomes smaller as, as pH rises, and the, 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 the uh, base is extensively protonated at low pH, and then the fraction of unprotonated base rises and eventually plateaus. And if you take the product of these two, which is Fa, Fb, and you plot that, you see this uh, bell shape. And if we look at the uh, VS ribozyme as, a as its rate as a function of pH, and these are experiments as, as much of the mechanistic work I shall tell you about is, is Tim Wilson's work, uh, postdoc in the lab, um, you see that indeed you get a bell-shaped curve uh, corresponding to two pKs, one which is low and one which is high, which would be consistent with an A and a G. Now, uh, the, the, the way uh, quickly to check that is to make a substitution. So let's, let's say, uh, um, take, take the G, which um, uh, is, is, is the pK of 8.5 here, and, and substitute that for something of a lower pK, so diaminopurine. 
And if we do that, then of course the FB curve should shift to lower pH, and so therefore the bell should shift down here. And that is exactly what happens, as you can see, that, that now we have a pH maximum around 5. Well, um, a great deal of, of, of mechanistic study um, uh, went into this and developed this and, uh, and so on. But let me cut straight to um, uh, the, the, the structure of this ribozyme. This was the... the, 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 the took the longest to get this structure of all the nucleolytic ribozymes, and we worked on this for many years. Um, in the end, we, we, we actually collaborated with, with Joe Picciarelli in, 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 in Chicago, who had this, this antibody method for, for, for crystallizing uh, the, 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 the ribozymes. So it's kind of a long story, but let me, let me give you the, the bottom line of what the structure is. So um, here's the secondary structure, as you've already seen it, with this critical A and this critical G and the cis phosphate. Now, in, in the crystal, it's in this form. Now, I should say it's actually there in dimeric form, which was something that was anticipated by the biochemistry. But all I'm doing here, I've isolated out one complete functional unit, which actually contains part of both molecules. And uh, you can see uh, within that representation, the, 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 the cis phosphate, the G and the A, all come together in the same region, which is this region here. And if we focus in on that, so what you're looking at now is this, this is the cis phosphate, which is, is there. And the A621 is on the, the, the three prime side, G620 on, on, on the five prime side. So that's there and there. So, so so that, that is the, uh, where, where, where the chemistry happens. And then we see uh, uh, G620 is stacked with that, that critical guanine, the G638 that we were proposing as the base. So it's exactly where it needs to be. And similarly, A756, the, the putative acid, is stacked with A621. Those are, are there. And if we just zoom in on those bits now, you can see this more clearly. So there's G638 next to the, the 2 prime hydroxyl, which is going to be the nucleophile. There is A756, um, which is, is poised by the 5 prime uh, oxygen, uh, ready to protonate the oxyanion leaving group. Now, interestingly, we, we, we've also made a considerable study in my lab of another ribozyme, the, the hairpin ribozyme. And we had noted, before we had all these structures available, that it, it seemed that although the overall structure of these two ribozymes is very, very different, if you focus in just on the, the active centre, then the constellation of functional um, elements seems to be exactly the same. So what you find is, in, in both cases, two loops have to interact. And in one of them, you find the cis phosphate and the G, and in the other loop, you find the A. That is true in the hairpin, that is true in the VS. And you, and you see, if you look at the, second, uh, the, the, the active sites, they have very, very similar organisations. So it seems almost certainly that is due to convergent evolution, that they've arrived at a very similar solution. There are probably relatively few solutions to how to do RNA catalysis, and these two ribozymes have independently found the same solution. Now, you can ask, well, how good is this as a ribozyme? How good is it as an enzyme? Um, now, uh, the, 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 the fast, these are not fast enzymes, okay? So, so a, a fast VS ribozyme to us would, would operate at about 10, uh, 10 per minute. Uh, so K-OBS is 10 per minute. But then you've got this fraction FAFB, and we can say, well, what is that at neutral pH? And, and you calculate that from the pKa's is about 10 to the minus 3.3. So therefore, K-cat is about 10 to the 4 per minute. Two times 10 to the 4 per minute. And that is actually very comparable with the, the value for, for the protein enzyme ribonuclease A. So actually, uh, RNA is not such a bad uh, uh, enzyme, except that it's massively limited by the, the kind of extreme pKa's of the uh, bases. Okay, now I want to switch to a, a, a much newer ribozyme, the twister ribozyme, which is a, another member of this group here. And this was discovered in, in Ron Breaker's lab in, in Yale. And in its simplest form, it's, it's, it's a stem loop with, with a couple of internal uh, loops. And then plus, um, uh, and one of those contains the, the cleavage site here. 
And then there are two tertiary interactions. So phylogenetics shows that there's a base pairing interaction between this sequence here and this sequence up here, and this sequence here, and this sequence here. So it's clearly going to be a complex pseudo knot. And then um, in, in, in this simple form, there are five nucleotides apparently unpaired here, uh, but in 75% in of these ribozymes, that is replaced by another helix called P3, which slots in there. And um, so once again, the mechanistic studies in, in my lab were carried out by Tim Wilson. And um, this, uh, this shows just the, the experimental data show, showing this ribozyme working. So you see um, uh, this is separation of the subst substrate and products during incubation in magnesium ions. And after about a minute, this reaction is substantially complete. This ribozyme is extremely widespread. Uh, it's found in, in many bacteria. It's found in eukarya, including um, uh, vertebrates and including plants, uh, but not uh, at the moment, as far as is known, in, in humans. Now, our first thoughts about the mechanism of this uh, came from looking at the sequence. So um, Ron Breaker had sent us a, a, a preprint of, of his work on this, and we looked at the sequence, and we particularly looked at the conserved nucleotides highlighted in red. So these are present in, in better than 97% of the, of, the, of the thousands of examples. And, and uh, well, so there's the cleavage site in, the, in this loop here. And so bearing in mind what I've told you about the VS and the hairpin ribozymes, which both conform to this, we were looking for a G within the same loop. And, and sure enough, of course, there's the cis phosphate. There is a G at this point. And then there are various other conserved A's elsewhere. So this G plus A kind of uh, idea uh, seems to be alive and well. And if that were ca the case, we would expect uh, a pH dependence that's a bell shape again. And sure enough, uh, there is a bell shape corresponding to pKa's of 6.9 and 9.5. There is clearly something, uh, probably a conformational change that is rate limiting that puts a, f a speed limit on this. But, but basically, you can see the, 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 the uh, bell shape pH dependence. OK, now. Uh, we took each of these modified, uh, sorry, each of these uh, conserved nucleotides and, and modified them, so typically G for A or A for G, and, and you can see uh, that the, 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 the cleavage rate um, varies greatly depending on which, which modifications you make. Um, and then we, 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 we also measured the rate at low pH and high pH, which is a good indicator of, of, of function. And now, uh, okay, so black is low pH, white is high pH, and this is faster and this is slower. And what I particularly want to draw your attention to, you immediately see, is this G that I fingered a minute ago, G45, is, takes a hundredfold hit if you change it to A, but is rescued by low pH. And that is exactly what we would expect. And if we do the full pH titration curve, you see, just as we saw with that G inosine modification in VS, the, the whole bell shifts to low, low, low pH uh, with a maximum around 5. So we were fairly convinced that was likely to be an important player. So. In parallel with that, uh, we um, uh, set up crystal trials uh, for this. Uh, so this was the work of, of Leo E. Jing, uh, a, a postdoc in, in, in my lab. And, and we, we chose this simplest form, which lacks this P3 helix here. And <coughs> if you transcribe this, uh, then all you see is essentially product. So it's, it's completely active, this form. Um, um, uh, but in fact, uh, for the crystallography, we chose to make this by chemical synthesis. Now, this has a number of advantages. Firstly, we can remove the 2' hydroxyl from, from U6, so we're removing the putative nucleophile in the, in the reaction, so it won't eat itself in the crystal. And secondly, we can introduce bromocytosine in order to phase um, our, our diffraction. Uh, okay, so, so we've collected native and, and, and the, the brominated um, uh, forms, and, and two things, just two things I want to draw your attention to. Firstly, our resolution is, is 2.3 angstroms, which is, as you'll see, is pretty good. And secondly, the space group is P6522, and that, that becomes relevant shortly. 
Um, okay, so let's have a look at the structure. And before I do that, let me just, just tell you that, that two other groups, those of, 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 of Tom Stites and, and Dinshaw Patel, I don't know who's here yet, I haven't seen him, um, uh, have also solved structures. Uh, so, so actually this slide is somewhat out of date now, but anyway. Um, uh, so uh, they're, they're, they're different types. So ours has no P3 helix. These two have P3 helices. Um, uh, but you, know, you, can, you, can, you can look at the others and, and see which you like best. Anyway, here's, here's uh, the, the electron density, uh, the, the map, 2FO minus FC map of, of, of our structure. And uh, it's pretty good everywhere except at this top. So this is the, 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 the loop two region uh, and clearly that's that's mobile and flopping about and and, and is not um, you can't really pick out one or two nucleotides in this but apart from that the electron density looks looks kind of crummy from here but but it really is pretty good and in fact I, I think you could sequence this RNA from from this map okay now let's let's have a look at this structure so Four different representations on this. So, as we look at the the the, uh, the 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 backbone of this structure, that red ball there, that's the cisyl phosphate. So that's the active send up right in the middle of, of this ribozyme, and this is the sequence. Now, what you see is so there's 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 one uh, very long coaxial stack that runs through this, which is, is running uh, basically right through here. Okay, and that's depicted here. So that comprises the P1 helix, the first, which is there, and then you have this first uh, tertiary interaction, T1, which is the green, which is there. Then you come into P2, which is yellow, which is there, and then the second T2 interaction, which is there, which is there. And then everything hinges around the L2 region, and then P4 comes down. So P4 is that part there, and then the loop of that, that makes all the tertiary interactions. And that's the key to understanding this structure. So if we follow that around, if we start from this U24 here, that is there. Okay, that finishes off the P4 helix, and then you come down into this first tertiary interaction. So from C25, 26, 27, 28, that's that interaction. And from there, you come back to this A29, which is, is, is matched, is base paired with the U24. So that finishes off the P4 helix. But from there, we come back up to here for the second tertiary interaction. So we come up to G30, and then C31, which is making that interaction. And you notice that G30 is above C31 here. So in fact, what's happened is, with this first tertiary interaction, you're coming upwards, then you come around, you're coming back down again uh, for the T2. So they're of opposite polarity. And I think that's a unique fold. I, I don't know any other RNA that d in, uh, displays that. And if we compare that with the other two ribozymes that, that, that um, uh, use uh, a tertiary, and, uh, sorry, pseudonauts. This is glumes. Glumes, if you cut that, you could divide this into two pseudonauts, one and two. HDV is a, is a complex nested pair of pseudonauts, but Twister has this uh, two pseudonauts of inverted polarity. And as I say, that's unique. Now, um, if we look at, okay, so we've got these, these conserved nucleotides that we, we indicated in red earlier. And, um, and are indicated in red on here. And um, what are they doing? Why are they conserved? In fact, we can explain every one of these because they are all making either base pairing or triple interactions, tertiary interactions. They're all serving an important function. And that uh, convinces us that the basic fold we have here is correct. And I should say it is also completely consistent with the Patel and the, the Stites structures. So I, I have no doubt that it is basically correct. You'll, you'll see why I'm emphasizing this in a minute. Now, what about this P3 helix? Where is that within the structure? Now, you notice that we have the, 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 the T2 interaction, and then the P3 helix uh, uh, directly connects that to the P4 helix here. Whereas in our structure, we've got five nucleotides there. But, but we've got a C, A, A, U, G. In fact, that C and that G are base paired in our structure. Um, uh, so they're, they're here, and that CG forms a base pair which is coaxial with the, 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 the T2, so it adds to this coaxial stack here. And then the, the, the extra, the three remaining nucleotides, although we can't really see them properly because of the, the fuzziness of our density, that, that sits here. So it's obvious where that extra helix has got to go. It must go uh, here. It's 
fits in there and would undoubtedly stabilise that structure. And in, in, in the Patel and Stite structures, there, there's a P3 structures. That's where the helix is. Okay. Now, what we really want to know is about the, the, the active centre. Where is that? So, remember, that's the cis-L phosphate there, <coughs> which is there. And our first thing to notice is there's G45. This was the base we were arguing was playing a key role in the chemistry. So G45 is here. Um, however, there is a problem. And the problem is the following. Uh, we don't have a 2' hydroxyl, uh, the nucleophile, in our structure, but we can model it on and, and it would go there. Now the problem is we need to attack the phosphorus in line. We want to donate a lone pair of electrons from that oxygen into the vacant d orbitals of the, of the phosphorus. So it has to be in line and it's almost 180 degrees from where it needs to be. Now um, uh, you, you notice that the, 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 the bases flanking the cis phosphate are kind of on the same side. This base has actually been hijacked and pushed into this position. And the reason it's been hijacked, remember I said that we have this um, um, P6522 symmetry. So we've got these extra two-fold axes. And so you've got symmetry-related molecules that are related by two-fold uh, within the structure. And one of those is the problem. Uh, so, so there, in colour, is one of our ribozymes. There is the symmetry-related molecule in, in, in grey. And you see there is an interaction there. And if we focus in on that, uh, there's the U6. And it has been sucked out of, of the ribozyme by forming this interaction with G23 in the symmetry-related molecule. That is the problem. Now, if we look at... This is a... Ferry de Mare, Adrian Ferry de Mare's structure of the hairpin ribozyme with, a, with a, a vanadium as a transition state analogue in place of the pentacoordinate phosphorus. And, and so it's necessarily in line. And what you see is that the two bases flanking the cis phosphate have this kind of um, fl flayed apart, splayed apart nature. That's what you've got to do to get in line. And we don't. In our case, they're on the same side, like this. And so I said to Leo E. Jing, well, we could see in the structure that <coughs> there was a lot of room in the major groove under G45. That was the obvious place to flip this around. And it looked like there was nothing in the way to stop that. So I said to Leo E. Jing, why don't we just try and, uh, and model this? See if you can turn it around. Don't do anything fancy. We don't want to do any molecular dynamics or anything, yet at least. Let's just see if we can simply move it around. So that's what uh, Leo E. Jing did, and this is, this is immediately what we got. So um, uh, now you can see that the, uh, 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 the two prime hydroxyl is indeed approximately in line. And as a bonus, look where it is. It's right next to N1. <coughs> of G45, exactly where it would need to be to be deprotonated by G45. And if we compare that uh, remodel structure here with that of the, 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 the hairpin transition state analogue, you see they're very, very similar and they both have this kind of splayed apart nature. So, in, in this remodel structure, we've, we've put this back into, the, effectively back into a more or less normal helical geometry. I, I, in order to achieve this splayed nature, it's actually A7 on the, on the three prime side of the cis phosphate that is drawn out of the helix. And it sits right at the base of the, the, the P4 helix sitting here. And if we look at the environment of that, we see that it's, it's, it's placed in a, in a beautiful pocket. So it's, it's exocyclic N6 here is, is hydrogen bonded to successive uh, uh, phosphates, non-bridging oxygen. So the pro-S oxygen of this phosphate, the pro-R oxygen of this in, in the T1 helix. And then it's O2 prime is hydrogen bonded to, to N3 of this, this adenine here. So it's very precisely held in a pocket, uh, and, and that is one of the two reasons we think that that is important, actually. The other one I'm about to come on to. So, so kind of finally, uh, the last part of this mechanism, um, can we go one step further and, 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 and try and uh, get, get a more complete mechanism? So we're arguing uh, attack of the 2' prime hydroxyl uh, and, and breaking the bond to the, uh, the O5 prime, and um, uh, we... we, we, we 
um, uh, have identified G45. Now, given its position in the structure, it is almost certainly going to be the general base in the cleavage reaction, but formally, from a chemical point of view, we, we haven't proven that. So I, I'll, I'll be agnostic about it for now and say G45 could be the general base here or it could be the general acid here. But anyway, what is the other one? What is the question mark? What is the other base? Let's pH dependence says it's got to be something of low pK, probably an adenine. Uh, okay, let's look at all the, those key conserved adenines. So um, A28 is formed, forming a base pair here with A46. A8 is forming a base pair with G45. Most are doing important stuff. They, they, they clearly can't be change moved into a position where they could participate in the chemistry. The only two that, that could are A7, the adjacent adenine, and A29, which sits up here. Now, I have to say, uh, my immediate thought was, oh, it's got to be A29. It looks in, in, to be in the right position. Sounds like everything I've seen in similar ribozymes. However, there's a problem. Um, uh, firstly, when we change this to a G, it only changed the lowered the activity by tenfold, which is frankly not enough. And secondly, when we look at the pH dependence of the A29G, we see it's it's essentially identical to that of the wild type. So although had I had I had only the structure to go on, I would have bet the ranch on A29, because no denying the chemistry. It's telling us it can't be that. So what else? So that leaves A7. Now A7 is Unusual uh, is unprecedented in that it is adjacent to the sisal phosphate, but nevertheless, in our remodeled structure, it, it, it is reasonably close to the O5 prime to which it would need to donate a proton. However, the nitrogen that's close is not the usual N1, but actually N3. So we did some chemistry on this, and in particular, we did experiments substitution with uh, diaza forms where we change a nitrogen for a CH, so atomic mutagenesis. And firstly, if, if we change this nitrogen, N7, for, for, for CH, that shifts the pKa up by, by, by um, 1.5, so we would expect the reaction profile to follow that, and indeed it does. Uh, these are all done as double substitutions, which kind of complicates the analysis a little bit, but but, but uh, the, the wild type equivalent, at least, is the dotted line here. And this is the modified ribozyme. And you can see the reaction profile has shifted up by 1.5, corresponding to this change that we've made. So that is completely consistent with that adenine participating. But of course, what we really want to do is, well, if we're arguing that N3 here is, is the key player, let's change that. Uh, so when we did that, uh, uh, that, that's shown here, uh, we see that after 3,963 uh, 3, minutes, which is about 66 hours, there's no sign of a product here. So this, this is at least um, four or five orders of magnitude slower. Um, so removing that single nitrogen has made that as dead a ribozyme as you will see. Now, of course, the control of that is, well, but what about if we changed N1 rather than N3? Does that have the same effect or not? Well, unfortunately, that required some chemical synthesis. We, we couldn't just buy that. Um, so uh, a former postdoc, Steffi Shaw, uh, synthesized that. And, and uh, when we did that, you see that after 90 seconds of incubation, we do have a significant amount of product. Compare that with the N3 uh, version, where um, uh, after 66 hours, there's nothing. So... Um, I don't think this is, this is a completely finished story, but I think, I think the, the evidence is now fairly strong. And, and certainly our, our working model for this ribozyme then is that uh, the general base in the cleavage reaction is G45, deprotonating the um, two prime hydroxyl, and the general acid is the adjacent A7 and N3 of the adjacent N7, um, which comes within about three angstroms there in the remodeled structure. So we now sort of generalize this a little bit more, compare this uh, with the other nucleolytic ribozymes. Interestingly, uh, uh, five out of the six nucleolytic ribozymes all seem to use a guanine as the general base in the cleavage reaction. 
Um, the only exception to that is, is the hepatitis delta virus ribozyme, where really I have to say it's not known what the base is, but the best bet is that it's an inner sphere water molecule of a bound magnesium ion. The acid, however, is somewhat more variable. You've seen that in the hairpin and the VS, it's the N1 of an adenine which is, is remote within the structure. The twister is also an adenine, but is different in that it is the adjacent adenine, and it is N3 and not N1. Um, interestingly, HDV is, is a somewhat similar situation to, to the other three in that it's not adenine but cytosine, another base of low pKa, so it's N3 of cytosine. In the hammerhead ribozyme, uh, the, the best evidence, though I don't think it's 100% proven at the moment, but the best evidence is it's actually a 2' prime hydroxyl of G8 in that case. Um, and in GLMS, it's, it's arguably the most interesting of all of these, in G GLMS, GLMS is also a riboswitch. It is a riboswitch that binds a small molecule, which is glucosamine 6 phosphate. The general base in that ribozyme is, is, is G33 or 40, depending on whose numbering system you use, either Ferry de Mare or Strobel. But that, that is poised to, to remove the 2' hydroxyl proton. But the general acid is the amine of the glucosamine 6 phosphate. So this is a ribozyme that is using a coenzyme, uh, and that's sort of unprecedented. And you know, has massive implications for uh, the RNA world and how you expand the range of chemistry that RNA could do if you're allowed to use uh, coenzymes. Okay, so um, finally, um, um, in general though, the nucleolytic ribozymes all seem to conform. Uh, it's, it's always very hard. When, when do you truly know you've, you've established the mechanism? Probably never. It's extremely hard to, to, to nail these things down completely. But I think as, as best we can uh, tell, uh, they, they all use general acid-based catalysis, uh, a base to remove the, 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 the two prime hydroxyl proton, an acid to deprotonate de the, the uh, to, 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 to protonate the five prime oxyanion leaving group. The of course, by, by the uh, principle of microscopic reversibility, when you consider the, the uh, ligation reaction, then everything changes, and, and, and this becomes the acid deprotonating a five prime oxygen nucleophile, and, and this becomes, uh, uh, that, sorry, that's the base, did I say acid? Th this becomes then the acid protonating a two prime hydroxyl leaving group. Um, uh, okay, now interestingly, as we, as we move up to the larger ribozymes, so uh, ribonuclease P and, and the various self splicing introns, we seem to leave the world of general acid based catalysis behind. And these are all uh, metalloenzymes using uh, metal ions to position uh, the, the, the components and, and increase the reactivity of, of, of the, the uh, nucleophile, for example. And, and that, so, so, so the, 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 these recapitulate the two ways of doing this in, in the protein world. So, so I mean, the, the polymerases, the um, uh, uh, restriction enzymes, for example, they all use this kind of uh, two-metal ion or something more elaborate kind of mechanism. And then, finally, once we get up to peptidyl transferase, um, uh, it doesn't seem to use either of these. There's no, no evidence for metal ions playing a role, um, direct role in the chemistry, uh, nothing uh, in, the, in the way of general acid-base catalysis, although you do seem to shuttle protons around, uh, particularly the, the, the uh, terminal uh, uh, ribose of, of the tRNA in the P site seems to, probably seems to help shuttle protons around. Okay, my chairman is approaching me, so time is perfect, right? Um, so I just want to thank the people that have been involved in these studies. Um, uh, Tim Wilson has been involved in all the mechanistic studies. Um, Leo E. Jing, uh, the, the crystal structure of the, the, the um, uh, twister. Um, uh, uh, Stephanie Shaw, uh, chemical synthesis. Scott McPhee has synthesized all our RNA. And, our, and that is not trivial. I mean, TR, the, the twister is, is 57 nucleotides in, in length. That was chemically synthesized, uh, sufficient to give good, good crystal data. And I, I think that's a testament to, to his abilities. And then the, 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 the VS uh, crystallographic work, that, that, that was a long collaboration with, 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 with Joe Picciarelli and, and, and Nikolai Suslov. And the work is funded by Cancer Research UK, and I'm pleased to say, as of two days ago, I know that they're going to fund us for a further five years, uh, so that's a, a massive relief. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.